the appeals of railway modeling is the diversity it offers. From large scale to small scale. From main line to branch line. And from collaborative effort to individual passion. In this program, we shall be studying two magnificent examples of this diversity. The 16 mm scale Linbridge layout is a model on a huge scale in every sense. Whilst the N-gauge Chi Tor layout is small in scale, but immense in concept. We shall also be returning to the Jura Simplon layout featured in volume two of this series for a close-up look at the scenery construction techniques employed by Dave Angel. Both Linbridge and Chi Tor evoke the authentic atmosphere of an actual prototype and are visionary in concept. So, although as different as two layouts could be, they are a common source of encouragement to all of us who strive for that combination of authenticity and flair that is the hallmark of a classic layout. Let us begin by visiting Linbridge. Henry Holdsworth's Linbridge layout is based on the Linton and Barnstaple Railway in Devon, which began operating in 1898. Never really profitable, the line was taken over by the Southern Railway in 1923. Although improvements were made, the challenge of the motor bus proved too much, and the last train ran on the 29th of September, 1935. As we wait at Linbridge for the arrival of the train that will convey us around the layout to Manning Wharf, we can see how superbly Henry Holdsworth model catches the atmosphere of the prototype in the scale of 16 millimeters to the foot. One of the few 16 millimeter scale layouts to have been created indoors, it is a project on a large scale in every respect occupying its own purpose-built railway room that measures 30 feet by 12 feet 6 inches. Linbridge, which occupies one side of the railway room, is a scale model of Linton Station. The platform is to scale length, but the goods sidings have been shortened to fit into the available space. Also, the road alongside the station, which on the prototype slopes steeply away from rail level, has had to remain horizontal to allow access to the hidden sidings beneath. Otherwise, Linbridge is an accurate representation of the original. On the model, at least, the station is always a hive of activity, and the eagle-eyed can usually pick out the odd celebrity waiting to embark upon a journey. train has arrived. As the locomotive runs round the carriages in preparation for departure, it gives us an opportunity to note an unusual feature of Linbridge. 
the facing crossover at the platform end. This was designed to permit easy shunting of goods wagons into the sidings. In the early days, the wagons were always attached to the loco ahead of the coaches. So the loco collected outgoing wagons, ran round the train, and then pushed the incoming stock into the goods depot. The locomotive rostered for our train is one of the three attractive 262 tank engines built by Manning Warden of Leeds in 1897 for the opening of the prototype line. These were each named after Devon Rivers. The X, the Yaw and the Tor. A fourth locomotive, a Baldwin 242 tank, arrived in 1898 and was named Lynn. After taking over the line, the Southern ordered another loco in 1925. Named Liu, this was based on the same Manning Wardle drawings as the earlier engines, but with a modified cab. The carriage doors are open, a trick we'll explain later, and the passengers are ready to embark. There's time for one last goodbye and for the needy one other final preparation. Then it's all aboard for Manning Wharf. The signalling at Limbridge follows the southern arrangement and includes the superb bracket signals operated from a vintage Hornby lever frame. With departure imminent, not everyone has arrived with time to spare. Thankfully, Henry Holdsworth's miniature booking clerks are always helpful, and even the driver is willing to wait a moment. As we leave Limbridge, the enthusiasts on board will no doubt cast a discriminating eye over the engine shed on the far side before settling down to enjoy the journey. Soon the train passes under Caffin's Bridge and we are out into open country. Henry Holdsworth is an accomplished model engineer and the layout was planned as a showcase for his locos and rolling stock. As he was keen to run other two-foot gauge prototypes in addition to Linton and Barnstaple, the non-Linbridge half of the layout, which our train is now entering, is a freelance arrangement. Shortly, our train will pass the mill. In the meantime, we can take the opportunity to admire Henry Holds with construction work and learn a little of his methods. The huge 16 mm scale buildings permit the inclusion of a fine level of detail. This creative scope has been well utilized on Linbridge, thanks to Henry's sense of observation and his ability to translate his vision into practical reality. The basic material used on all his models is plywood which is shaped using his treadle fret saw, now over 50 years old. Here we see Linbridge Station while under construction. The model is a staggering 115 centimetres, or 45 inches, long. The goods shed also boasts impressive dimensions. It is 102 centimetres, or 40 inches, in length. The stonework is drawn out from colour slides taken at the prototype location and projected onto a movable card system adjusted to give a scale size to window or door apertures. Each individual stone is textured with tetrion filler and coloured with emulsion or acrylic paints. Returning briefly to Linbridge, where another train is about to arrive, we can see how detail also extends to the interiors. 
Clearly, the scenes inside the station building are equally evocative as those on the exterior. Meanwhile, back at the mill, the distant echo tells us that our train is about to pass. The miller checks his watch as the rural atmosphere, so lovingly recreated by Henry Holdsworth, prepares to be momentarily eclipsed by the clatter of wheels rolling over Lancy Brook Viaduct. The freelance half of the layout has been designed to show off stock to best advantage. Here there are four bridges grouped amidst undulating scenery that drops to sea level at the quay. Collard Bridge and Lancy Brook Viaduct, which can be seen beyond it, are both based on Linton and Barnstable prototypes. The latter, seen here under construction, is over eight feet long and was built on a stout, flat plywood base. Its track is on a gradient rising one inch over its length. Collard Bridge was constructed using photographs. Its 5,000 separate bricks each receive two coats of humbrol and have been effectively set off with the dark red brick trim. Brinley Fellin, spanning just over four feet, is derived from the prototype on the Welsh Highland Railway. Henry photographed and measured the prototype before constructing his model entirely from plywood. Another Welsh-inspired bridge is Banwy, based on the original found on the Welsh Pool and Llanfair Railway. The model is about six feet long, and the general design is representative of those found on several narrow-gauge railways in Britain. To allow for the multiple levels and inclines, the baseboards have been built using the L-girder system. A 15 mm thick track subbed carries a 12 mm softboard track base. This has beveled edges to represent the ballast profile. Scenery is added to this open top structure by first stapling chicken wire to the subbase. Several thicknesses of newspaper soaked in paste are layered over this then a final layer of brown craft paper is added. Over this, scenic colours and finishes such as dyed wood flour are applied. The scenery has subsequently been updated to give a more realistic appearance by using carpet underfelt, spray paints and acrylics. <laughs> A particular problem facing the large-scale modeler is trees. On Limbridge, Henry has dealt with this by once again using his favorite raw material, plywood. In this case, the basic structure has been shaped from 6 mm plywood. Winter photographs of leafless trees have been used to check for the right proportions. A bark effect on the trunks has been achieved by coating the plywood base with tetrion. The trees are brought to life through the addition of leaves supplied with Britain's 4mm scale oak tree kits. Their plastic appearance has been improved by spray painting and adding flock powder. The overall effect is very pleasing with some trees reaching a height of 2 feet. The track work has been mostly hand built to suit the formation. Sleepers are cut from hardwood then stained and laid in aquarium gravel, which makes a very lifelike ballast in 16 mm scale. The exception to this is the hidden sidings beneath Limbridge Station. Here, trains are marshalled with the aid of a traverser. 
a space-saving device that can be constructed in any scale. After bringing a train in, the locomotive is uncoupled and moves onto the traverser. It can then be slid across onto any spare track where it is released to run round the train. The readily available Pico Streamline SM32 track work has been used throughout the hidden sidings. Accurate for modelling two-foot gauge prototypes in 16mm scale, it has provided faultless operation for over 20 years. Returning to the freelance side of the layout, our train is now approaching Manning Wharf. Like Lindbridge, Manning Wharf is alive with hustle and bustle. A busy port where people and cargo are constantly transferring between rail and sea. Here too, Henry Holdsworth's eye for detail is clearly in evidence. And the wooden station building makes a pleasing contrast with the attractive stone buildings at Lindbridge. With the arrival of a freight close behind our train, Manning Wharf bursts into activity. prominent feature on this freelance part of the layout and they come in all types and sizes. The coaster is in fact an Irish design. It was built entirely from scratch by Henry Holdsworth. 54 inches long, the model is once again made entirely from plywood except for the funnel and ventilator cowls. Another regular visitor to this busy quay is the paddle steamer. Shown here while under construction, it is yet another example of the meticulous modelling style adopted by Henry Holdsworth using his favourite medium of plywood. Although its name may suggest otherwise, the model has been based on Dartmouth Castle, which operated in Devon from 1907 to 1947. As the steamer's passengers prepare to leave port, so too does the goods train, now fully loaded with coal from the adjacent coaster. Although goods traffic on the prototype declined under the Southern Railway, in Linton and Barnstable days, there were 24 goods wagons, all randomly numbered by their builders, the Bristol Wagon and Carriage Company. These included four-wheel and bogey open wagons, four-wheel vans, bogey brake vans and bogey flats. A good selection of this rolling stock, totaling 16 vehicles, has been modelled by Henry Holdsworth to date. The train that brought us to Manning Wharf is about to leave again. New passengers have boarded, but yes, it's that man again. It seems he woke up just in time, and now it's the steamer he's racing to catch. of Henry Holdsworth Linbridge model are the locomotives and rolling stock. The prototype, Linton and Barnstable, had 17 coaches. Although the livery was later changed to all brown, the original livery was chestnut or terracotta, 
with very pale salmon upperworks. Although supplied in seven different combinations, their uniform outlines added to the attractiveness of the train. Ten coaches have been built for the layout, reflecting all of the different combinations. With the exception of Tor, all locomotives have been hand-built from plywood and authentically livered. The original Mannings had an attractive livery of holly green outlined in black. But under Southern Railway ownership, the livery was changed to an olive green with the large southern lettering on the tank sides. Coaches too were changed under southern ownership to the company's standard green. Although Henry has created what is perhaps the finest representation of the Linton and Barnstable prototype ever built in model form, this has not limited his pursuit of other interests. Two non-Linton locomotives have been constructed. The first, the South African Railway's Bayer Garrett NG11 class, number 54. Built in 1925, it is preserved at Port Elizabeth. The model is almost 30 inches long and is fitted with two Sagami motors. It has tremendous pulling power and it's interesting to watch as the rearmost engine appears to be trying to overtake the front one. The other non-Linton locomotive is a Hunslet 460 War Department tank built in 1916. It is envisaged as the first engine for a possible new layout running French, German and British two-foot gauge First World War stock. Meanwhile, it is equally at home hauling the mid-morning goods from Linbridge to Manning Wharf. Proof indeed that even when modelling a specific prototype, there is always scope for modeler's license. Perhaps that is part of the reason why Linbridge is such a pleasing layout. Full of closely observed detail, it evokes the atmosphere of a genuine prototype. And yet room has also been allowed for creative flair. It is the individual imaginative touches that bring the layout to life. One such touch mentioned earlier is the opening carriage doors. As promised, we can now reveal the trickery used to achieve this effect. It will be interesting to compare Henry Holdsworth's masterpiece with our other featured layout, Chi Tor, which is renowned for its spectacular scenery. But first, let us look at scenery construction in more depth. shortly see how landscape modelling can lie at the heart of a classic layout. Dave Angel's Jura Simplon line, located on the French-Swiss border and fully featured in volume two of this series, differs from Chi Tor in numerous respects, but shares one major characteristic in common. The landscape is integral to the model. Both layouts are based on regions of spectacular natural beauty, and their impact derives largely from their builder's mastery of scenic construction. But I, I read this particular book um, on, on a, an article called Zip Texturing. And it was a way that you could create rock very, very quickly. Um, again, you use the usual base methods of what everybody's used, chicken mesh, cardboard or whatever to start the basic shape of the, 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 the formation of rock that you wish to, to, to produce. And then you cover it with plaster, and then you go over it with this stippling method. 
The Andalo section of the Jura Simplon layout, shown here whilst under construction, provides an opportunity to see how the foundation for the scenery is built up in preparation for the modelling of the landscape profiles. Doug Wenberg, Dave's collaborator on the model, begins by adding blocks of polystyrene to fill out the spaces. Plywood formers have been pinned into position to act as a framework for the scenery. The strategically placed polystyrene blocks help fix the position of the scenery and also act as supports for additional features. Any items that are integral to the landscape model, such as roads and tunnel mouths, are also added at this stage. The combination of plywood formers and polystyrene has two main advantages. Firstly, both materials are easily shaped, enabling contours to be created exactly as required. Equally important, they are light in weight. Although particularly relevant to portable layouts, lightness also minimizes the stress to baseboards on permanent layouts. With the basic outline of the scenery in place, the real creative work begins. The main tools and materials are knives for carving, a paintbrush, some water, and a supply of polyfiller. The first step is to shape the basic contours. The polystyrene base material is easily carved into any desired shape, permitting interesting formations to be created. One advantage of this method is that it is literally possible to see the landscape taking shape. This is helpful in any landscape modelling situation, but even more so when working from photographs and drawings to replicate an actual prototype. The section being worked on here has been designed for demonstration purposes, but as on a real layout, the spaces for any bridges or roads can be marked up and cut out at the same time as shaping the polystyrene. It's always a good idea to cover the surrounding area with newspaper, since in return for being easy to cut, polystyrene inevitably crumbles into messy particles. Once the basic outline has been formed, plaster is mixed with water to give a rich consistency that can easily be applied over the polystyrene contours. This will eventually set hard to provide a strong permanent shell. Although theoretically most household plasters could be used, Dave Angel has found that polyfiller is by far the best choice. This is because after the plaster has been applied, Dave's method involves a further stage, stippling, that adds an extra degree of realism and texturing to the model landscape. When you've actually mixed the polyfiller up to the right consistency, which is very much like a, a very thick whipping cream, or if you've, you've watched your wife actually uh, do the icing on the Christmas cake and you can actually pull the icing up without it falling over, that gives you the idea of, of, of what you have to work your plaster to. With the polyfiller applied, Dave commences stippling, which involves going over the plaster surface with a brush dipped in water. A one or one and a half inch brush is best. It's important to start at the top and work down, as the water then runs down the face of the polyfiller and creates natural channels in the rock face, mimicking the effect of rain or river water on the real life landscape. When you actually place water on the brush onto the surface of the polyfiller, remember it's wet polyfiller, it actually has a second chemical effect onto the filler. And it creates these wonderful corrugations. Why? I don't know. But when you actually let it dry out, um, it looks absolutely wonderful. The stippled rock formation should be left for two to three days to dry. It will then be ready to receive the base colour, which should be applied to the whole area, ensuring that the natural colour of the polyfiller does not show through. The base colour should be chosen to match the predominant rock colour of the locality being modelled. For example, for a model set in Devon, the base colour should be dark red. 
Water paints, powder paints, or emulsion can all be used as a base, but they must be diluted. By regularly spraying water onto the surface during painting, we can, as with stippling, achieve a more natural effect. To add to the natural appearance of the rock, several layers of paint should be applied in this way, selecting a range of different colours that will blend together to create greater realism. Following painting, the rock will once again need to be left for two or three days to dry. Finally, using the wide range of proprietary flock materials available from Pico and others, foliage is applied over our landscape. Dave begins by adding a coat of glue to the whole area. Suitably diluted, it is best worked into the rock face using a brush. This will ensure that the glue finds its way into the many corrugations created earlier. He now goes on to apply the scenic flock material. For the main colours, it's advisable to use a sieve, since this enables good broad coverage to be obtained, whilst at the same time sprinkling the flock finely and evenly. As no real life landscape is entirely green, a blend of different coloured materials should be applied to produce a more realistic looking result. These can be complemented with natural materials such as sand. For the finishing touch, Dave adds some proprietary foliage and also some lichen, which more than adequately represents bushes. Again, this is held in place using diluted glue. As always, attention to detail brings the model to life and adds character to the layout. Different modelers have their own preferred ways of adding that personal touch. Dave Angel, for example, likes to apply crushed Cotswold stone at the base of the scenery to represent fallen rocks. B&Q high gloss yachting varnish is another of Dave's favourite materials. He applies 10 to 12 layers to provide a permanently wet looking surface for rivers and streams. As we can see from the finished scenery on the Jura Simplon layout, the overall result of these techniques is a striking representation of mountainous terrain. The realistic browny colour of the varnish enhances the effect of muddy water. Also, being non-drip, the varnish can be pulled up with a brush and worked into patterns that suggest flowing water. A comparison of the early construction stages with the finished layout sections underlines the effectiveness of good scenic modelling. So too does the Chi Tor layout, which we shall explore next. Equal to Linbridge in the scale of its concept, but at the opposite end of the size spectrum, Cheetor was designed to exploit the potential of N, the smallest practical scale, in a way never attempted before. The Manchester Model Railway Society's representation of a stretch of main line in the Peak District is a creative essay in the use of the small to depict magnitude. As always, when basing a model on a real-life prototype, the first step is to decide which line to model. In the case of the Manchester Model Railway Society, the modelers had established their basic requirements, scenic potential that would provide a setting for the trains, but the actual choice evolved. Initially, we were modelling the, or wanted to model the Somerset and Dorset Railway um, and we'd de developed some track plans based on Somerset and Dorset prototypes. Uh, then we happened to have a trip out to Derbyshire 
and we saw what was left of the old Midland Railway line from Derby to Manchester up through Monsaldale and Millersdale and decided that that would make quite a nice model. The opportunity came then to uh, go for a walk down part of the line. The railway itself at that time was long closed, it had been closed for 25 years or so. Um, but the track bed formed a footpath um, so you could get at the various features of the line. And that convinced us that that was the prototype for a grand scale scenic model, which is what we were looking for. So we adapted the plans to the Derbyshire Peak District um, and the valley up through Millersdale and Monsaldale. Although the spectacular limestone gorge of the River Wye in Derbyshire met most of the group's requirements, some rewriting of railway history was necessary to accommodate all the features required. The real Midland Railway line to Manchester ran through the Wye Valley, and the Cheetor Gorge is close to Millersdale, which was a large junction station on a double main line. However, even in N scale, some compression of the prototype is necessary. The solution has been to assemble authentic landscape features and structures from different parts of the area and locate them on an imaginary secondary cross-country line linking Derby to Manchester. The buildings and civil engineering structures, for example, although transplanted to new locations where it has been felt that this will enhance the model, are all based on genuine prototypes. What tended to happen was we'd come across a photograph of a particular building and someone would say, well, that would make a nice model. So providing it was of the right area and the right character, we would then set about uh, photographing it and modelling it to incorporate it. These varied in location between um, sort of Monsell Head and all the way up to Buxton, really. And we borrowed one or two features from other areas, uh, other limestone areas, particularly the Yorkshire Dales. So we weren't tied with just one stretch of valley as to what was there. We could pick and choose. The use of license in this way is one of the keys to the model's success. Cheetor has not been an exercise in replicating reality, more an attempt to capture the atmosphere of a prototype. It's a good example of how, far from suppressing imagination, the successful adaptation of a prototype is a way of expressing the genuinely creative nature of railway modelling. The model of Cheedale Station is based on Cromford. It has been relocated 10 miles further along the valley and the layout of the buildings has been adapted to suit the area depicted in the model. Equally attractive are the cottages, which have been transplanted on the model from their prototype setting at Clapham, Yorkshire. Despite their sophisticated appearance, the basic construction of the buildings is very straightforward. In most cases, the basic shell has been constructed from plastic art. It is the stonework that really gives them character. And this has been produced by applying milliput epoxy putty to the plastic art shell. Although as malleable as modeling clay, when it sets, the milliput becomes rock hard. Emerging from the storage yards to the north of the station, only a single track line is available. But south of the station, the line becomes double track.
It is at this end of the layout that the more open landscape gives way to the spectacular gorge inspired by the Y Valley. Many exhibition visitors have recognized the prototype location near Millersdale on which the model gorge is based. Comparison of the model with the real Peak District landscape illustrates how the interpretive approach adopted by the modelers has brought the model closer to the prototype than would have been possible through slavish adherence to the facts. In the prototype, the spectacular landscape of rivers, gorges and hills dominates everything. The model captures the essence of the prototype location by providing a setting within which the locomotives and rolling stock are dwarfed as they pass through the countryside. There can be no doubt that Chi Tour has fully exploited the potential of N-scale to provide a broad canvas, just as Henry Holdsworth has utilized the nature of 16mm scale to create a breadth of interest through detail. In many ways, working in two millimetres can be easier than working in larger scales because detail can be suggested or even painted on. Uh, it doesn't have to be fully modelled. It's the general impression that one's trying to create in two millimetre scale rather than a detailed model. In terms of construction, an accurate representation of the prototype gorge demanded the development of some interesting techniques. To begin with, the layout was drawn full size and the contours of the landscape were plotted. Although it was originally intended to model these contours using the chicken wire method used by Henry Holdsworth, extra lightness, important on a portable layout, was sacrificed in favour of the ability to shape the contours more precisely. Therefore, the basic framework was filled out using methods similar to those earlier demonstrated by Dave Angel, with plaster of Paris impregnated bandage being used on this occasion to provide the hard outer shell. The distinctive outcrops of rock were also modelled along the lines demonstrated by Dave Angel. We experimented with various materials, but the one that gave the best results was ordinary household lightweight plaster. This was applied very thickly, uh, up to about three inches thick, which was then carved to shape, working from photographs of the prototype. Uh, during the course of that work, we used something like 200 weight of plaster. <laughs> Having got the basic landscape and the rock faces, the texturing on it uh, comprises various proprietary texture materials and for some years before we actually started work on the scenery we'd been collecting um, anything that had suitable texture so in addition to the proprietary materials there was bits of old carpet tile bits of carpet under felt anything of a fibrous texture In one sense complete, Cheetor will continue to be improved over the years. However, it has already more than justified its creator's intentions, depicting a piece of England through which a railway was built, rather than a railway around which scenery was formed.
Of course, Cheetor is a model railway, so the trains are not merely incidental to the model. A wide variety of rolling stock is operated on the layout. The period modelled is British Railways around 1960, which permits a mixture of steam locomotives and early diesels. The trains are true to the type that would have been seen in the area, and rolling stock consists of a mixture of hand-built, kit-built and proprietary items. In the final analysis, however, it is the superb scenic modelling for which Chi Tor will always be remembered. One of our fellow members summed it up rather nicely recently by describing it as madness on a grand scale. I think for the next model we'll probably model the fins. Anyone contemplating building a model railway based on a prototype, Linbridge and Chi Tour are indeed inspirational examples. Linbridge has been developed by an individual modeler, but it has taken over two decades. Chi Tour was built in a somewhat shorter time, but it required the skills of a whole group of dedicated modelers. average enthusiast, with limited time and money at his or her disposal, may be well advised to choose a more modest project, at least to begin with. Nevertheless, the level of vision, the techniques and the skills exhibited by the modelers featured in this program are potentially within anyone's grasp. information about Linbridge can be found in the June 1983, October 1985, January 1990 and December 1990 issues of Railway Modeler. The layout is also featured in the January and February 1990 issues of Continental Modeler. Chi Tor is described in the November 1991 edition of Railway Modeler. Scenery construction by Dave Angel is featured in the October 1992 issue of Continental Modeler. <laughs>